Hi everyone, my name is Jack, and today we are going to review with you another horrible case. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click on the bell. The tragic story of the Rose family is considered one of the most bizarre and confusing crimes committed in America in recent years. This case struck investigators not only by its cynicism and cruelty, but also by the fact that the victims and the alleged perpetrators were close relatives. Despite the fact that many years have passed since the crime was committed, and the perpetrator has long served his harsh sentence behind bars, there are still many questions and white spots in this story. Many still do not believe in the fairness of the court's verdict. Now let's get down to business. It was an ordinary average family living in a provincial suburb of Bristol in the state of Tennessee and had never been on the radar of law enforcers before. The family was headed by elderly couple Curtis and Lena Maria Rose, who had lived together for over 40 years. They had two grown daughters and six grandchildren, but we will only look at those family members who were directly involved in this high-profile case. So, at the time of the crime in the house and the surrounding area were the elderly owners themselves, Curtis and Lena Maria Rose, their eldest daughter, 39-year-old Tosha Milhorn with her husband James and six children. Two of the children were Tosha and James's shared children, while the other three children were their heirs from a previous relationship. Also present in the house was a neighborhood girl who stopped by to play with them. It is worth noting that Tosha and James and their children lived at Tosha's parents' house for about two months, as their own home was undergoing renovations at the time. Later, another key player in those events, 19-year-old Seth Denton, arrived at the house. He was Toshi's eldest son, but his relationship with his mother and stepfather was strained, to put it mildly and they avoided communicating with each other in every possible way, and their last meeting ended in tragedy. According to neighbors, the Rose couple was quite happy and prosperous. Their daughter Tosha was also happily married to James, who worked as an auto mechanic and was fond of restoring vintage cars. It was the Rose couple's family home that was the scene of the carnage. Police officers who arrived on the call later dubbed it the worst crime scene they had ever seen and the bloodiest in the history of their quiet county. The bodies of two women, Lena Maria and Tosha, a mother and daughter, were found in the house, shot almost point blank. Tosha was in a chair at the dining room table, and her mother was lying on the floor between the table and the refrigerator. Also lying on the doorstep of the house was the critically wounded James, Tosha's husband, who was quickly rushed to the hospital. But despite the efforts of the doctors, the man soon died of extensive internal injuries and massive blood loss. None of the children in the house were injured. It is likely that they were not targeted by the shooter, or were simply not in his field of vision at the time of the massacre of the adults. Almost immediately after the crime, the police received two phone calls, one after the other. The first call came from the owner of the house, Curtis Rose, who said that his eldest grandson, Seth, had committed a shooting in the house and then fled the scene. But soon there was a call from Seth himself, who told a different version of what happened, and blamed everything on his grandfather, Curtis. In addition, it turned out that Seth was wounded in the arm and shot him Curtis. However, he did not deny it, saying that he was trying to detain his grandson and not let him escape from the scene of the massacre. The alleged killer, Seth Denton, was arrested in the hospital, where he sought medical help in connection with the wound. Then the investigation was to restore the chain of tragic events and find out what really happened in the house of the Rose family. Surprisingly, but for the basis of the investigation was taken only one version, and the second version was taken seriously only a few years later. On August 29, 2015, around 6 o'clock in the evening, residents of houses located near the scene of the crime heard a series of gunshots. No one paid much attention to it, as there were forests around, where hunting of wild animals and birds was allowed. Later, one of the neighbors noted that he was a little alarmed by the number of shots, and then the silence, but he did not consider it a good reason to call the police. Another neighbor testified at trial that in addition to the gunshots, 
He heard screaming and went out on the porch of his house to see what was going on. At that point, he saw a young man running down the path from the neighbor's house to a car parked by the road. He was being chased by another man, but because of the trees by the road, the witness had a poor view of what was happening. He only saw the guy jump into the vehicle, then two shots rang out, and then the car sped off. Just a few minutes later, neighbors heard the howling of sirens and saw police cars and emergency vehicles starting to arrive at Rose's house. And soon an air ambulance helicopter landed on the lawn outside the house, arriving to pick up James, who was still alive. Everything that was happening resembled the shooting of some movie, and none of the eyewitnesses did not understand what happened. Arriving police officers were met by the elderly owner of the house, who was holding a firearm, and another gun belonging to him was later found in his bedroom. Curtis told his version of events, which was taken as the basis of the investigation and was long believed to be the only one. According to Curtis, there was nothing to portend trouble that day. In his and his wife's house visited his daughter with his son-in-law and grandchildren, as well as a neighbor's child who came to play. He himself was tinkering in his trailer in the backyard of the house. He heard the sounds of gunshots, but like most neighbors, he didn't pay much attention to it, thinking it was hunters in the woods. Suddenly his oldest grandson, Seth, appeared at the trailer, arriving unannounced and looking very excited. The young man said there had been some kind of tragedy and asked him to call emergency services immediately. Curtis followed his grandson into the house, where he immediately came across the dead bodies of his wife and daughter. Curtis immediately thought of the children in the house. They were in the other room, frightened, but none of them were hurt. He took them to the back of the house and locked them up so they wouldn't see the horror that was going on in the house. While Curtis was calling emergency services, he saw his grandson hurriedly leaving the house and running toward the road. The homeowner drew his gun and began to chase Seth, believing that he was the killer. As Seth jumped into the car, Grandpa fired two shots. One bullet shattered the rear window without hitting the driver, and the second bullet hit Seth in the left shoulder. Despite the injury, he managed to get away, but after reaching the nearest house, Seth stopped to call the police and report what had happened. The local sheriff who was investigating was puzzled. The picture of the crime looked so strange and illogical that similar cases simply did not exist in his memory. In a breaking news report, he said that the investigators had a difficult job ahead of them to reconstruct the whole picture of the crime. After the arrest of Seth Denton, it was necessary to establish the motive why the young man had treated his family members so cruelly, and most surprisingly, such a motive was quickly found. Seth was the eldest child of his mother Toshi, whom she had given birth to in her early youth. Her relationship with the boy's father did not work out, and her son's upbringing was mostly handled by his grandparents, while the young woman settled her personal life. Also, according to some reports, Tosha suffered from bipolar affective disorder and periodically went to the clinic. Most likely, her son could also inherit this disease. Since childhood, the boy had a strong resentment towards his mother, whom he hardly ever saw. With age, this feeling turned into hatred, about which Seth often told friends and relatives. After graduating from school, the guy decided to go to serve in the army, and a year later, returning home, he again settled at his grandparents. However, soon the young man decided that he wanted to start an independent life and moved to the city, where he rented a small apartment with his friend. He got a job at one of the local fast food restaurants, but shortly before the tragedy, the guy was fired. Family and friends spoke positively about Seth, noting that he never had any violent tendencies, did not run with bad companies, and never broke the law. But despite the positive characteristics, detectives considered that the main motive of the crime was Seth's unpleasant feelings towards his mother and her current spouse. According to the investigation, the events of that day developed as follows. Around 5 p.m., Seth drove his car to the house of his grandparents. He was wearing a camouflage jacket, and in the car lay a semi-automatic rifle. He left the car by the roadside, and with the weapon in hand, he went to the house, entering through the back door. 
Seth then fired several shots, killing his mother, grandmother, and severely wounding his stepfather, before leaving the jacket and rifle by the back door and going to his grandfather's house and asking him to call the police. The order in which the shots were fired was never determined because Seth completely denied his guilt. In addition, it was unclear why he asked his grandfather to call the police rather than fleeing immediately from the scene of the crime. It is assumed that his main target were his mother and stepfather, and the guy killed his grandmother as an unnecessary witness. As the main evidence proving Seth's guilt, the case included his jacket and rifle, found on the threshold at the back door of the house, traces of blood on his shoes, as well as bullets found in his car. Remarkably, about a hundred rounds of ammunition in total were found, but no one questioned why he needed so many if he only planned to kill two people. Another oddity was the timing. According to the grandfather, after he and his grandson entered the house, where the terrible picture opened before his eyes, Seth hurriedly left the scene. Curtis himself found and took the children to safety, called the police, pulled out the gun he kept, and after all this, managed to catch up with his grandson and shot him twice. It was not until 2016 that the young man presented his version of what happened in court, which no one had previously considered for some reason. According to Seth, he has always been very close to his grandparents who raised him, but meetings with his mother he avoided by all means. As a teenager, he often went to shooting ranges with his grandfather, and it was his grandfather who encouraged him to join the army. On that fateful day, Seth called his maternal aunt Amanda, his mother's younger sister, and said he was going to visit his grandparents, but didn't want to meet his mother there. The woman did not know that Tosha and her husband were visiting her parents, so she assured Seth that he could go without fear of crossing paths with his mother and stepfather. Amanda confirmed that information in court, noting that her nephew couldn't have known that Tosha and James were at Rose's house. Seth had hoped that he and his grandfather would go to the shooting range, and that was the reason he had brought a rifle with so many rounds of ammunition. He drove up to the house, got the gun, and went straight to the trailer where Grandpa usually worked. There, his grandson showed him his rifle, and they had a little discussion about it. Curtis then headed for the house without letting go of the rifle, and his grandson followed him. Seth knew that his grandfather had a gun and expected him to follow him, and afterward they would shoot targets together. However, when Curtis entered the room, he immediately opened fire, and the people in the room did not even have time to realize anything and did not try to run away or hide. According to Seth's lawyers, Curtis may have had a temporary insanity, during which he killed members of his family. But this version seemed untenable, so it was not considered initially and marked in court. Although on the clothes and shoes of an elderly man also had traces of blood of the victims, he, for some reason from the very beginning, was not even included in the number of suspects. The young man in the dock was facing the capital punishment of death for the premeditated triple murder of his family members. His grandfather had been a key witness in the case from the beginning, and despite the fact that he had openly stated that he was prepared to kill his grandson that day, the court found such behavior justified. Curtis Rose was not taken to the station or questioned as a suspect, and his version of the events of that day was accepted as the only true one. In addition, many details and inconsistencies were simply overlooked and Seth's version was not even considered until a year and a half after the crime. Most of the physical evidence did confirm Curtis's words, but what was out of the picture was somehow ignored by the investigation. The main argument in court was that Mr. Rose had no obvious motive for killing his wife, daughter, and son-in-law. The version of temporary insanity seemed far-fetched and untenable. The trial lasted more than a week, during which time nearly 200 pieces of evidence were presented and dozens of witnesses, including neighbors, relatives, and family friends, were heard. The grandfather and grandson's testimony completely contradicted each other, and it was obvious that one of them was lying. The jury deliberated for several days. They admitted to being severely exhausted emotionally and physically, but when it came to a verdict, they unanimously stated that they had no doubt that the defendant was guilty of each of the counts charged. Thus, Seth Denton was found guilty of triple murder, 
but after a detailed review of all the evidence and circumstances of the tragedy, the court decided to exclude the death penalty from the possible punishments, changing the sentence to life imprisonment without the right to parole, at least the next 50 years. The convict himself never admitted his guilt. He is currently serving his sentence in a Tennessee prison. As for the orphaned children of Tosha and James Milhorn, they were left in the care of other family members, including their aunt Amanda and grandfather Curtis. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead. See you soon.